Michel, is Dr. Brennan Guillaume. I would like to uh, present him in a few words. Dr. Ganun Guillaume is the Secretary of General International Religion Liberty Association. Dr. Guillaume is the Director of the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Department of the Seventh day Adventist Church, where the headquarters in Washington, D.C., USA. He is the Secretary General of the International Religious Liberty Association. He is the Secretary of the Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communions. He is co organizer of this conference. And, uh, Dr. Dio uh, will be the keynote speaker in the first session. And as keynote, uh, he's entitled to 20 minutes of. Uh, and, and most importantly, is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And he was my boss, so <laughs> connecting. Thank you so much for the kind words of introduction. And I realized that I have been upgraded to the status of being a boss. I don't know what it means, but anyway. Um, thank you so much for your kind words of introduction. So for my 20 minutes, I would like to uh, today to introduce basically our day and then the conference somehow with, the, with a title um, as follows. Justice and righteousness, common core values in religions, and then Cullen, building a better future. Actually, to contribute to the aspiration of building a better future for all the human family, I have chosen to briefly speak about the incontrovertible and necessary virtue of righteousness. Not just justice, by the way, but righteousness also. Uh, if I were to reframe the title of our conference, if uh, Professor Maos gave me a second chance to come up with a different title, uh, I will put it as follows. And maybe yesterday you had a taste already of bringing together three aspects contained in the title. Uh, and it would be binding people together in acts of solidarity for the building of peace. So binding people together, so that's basically religion, uh, in acts of solidarity, that's the second key concept, uh, for the building of peace. And uh, these three activities, if I may say, knowing that I'm in Israel, I can take some liberty to, to, uh, uh, to uh, speak as follows. These three activities are grounded, in fact, in the reality of justice and righteousness, mishpat and tzedakah. Um, just maybe briefly, some uh, philological consideration. Why is our topic this important? Righteousness is the translation, as I just mentioned, of, of, uh, of the Hebrew root sadak, sedek. Uh, and excluding the occurrences in proper names, it occurs, now think about this, 523 times in the Hebrew Bible. And once in the Aramaic section of the book of Daniel. It is well attested in West Semitic sources. And of course, if we expand the Greek root dikaio, as in the root, uh, the verb dikaiosune, translated usually by, uh, as righteousness, appears over 225 times in Christian scriptures. So two interrelated etymology are mentioned. On the one hand, the concept of righteousness could be connected to the Anglo-Saxon root rightwise, uh, along with the um, with the word right, righteous, righteousness, be or declared, made righteous. And on the other hand, you have the Latin root justicia, where we have the word just, justice, justification, and justify. Of course, if the number of occurrences of a word determines its importance, then the concept of righteousness 
uh, would be really prominent, and I can even say is the most important um, word in the religious vocabulary. The, of course, theological connotation of this concept, especially in monotheistic religious tradition, provide more evidence for its importance um, on the edifice of each religious tradition. And this is what is really fascinating, that regardless what religion you take, whether Judaism, whether Christianity or Islam, and even expanded to East Asian religions, the word righteousness is foundational, is core. But why is that so? This is what I would like to briefly talk about. So um, justice is part of the deepest human aspiration. From the dawn of, of civilization to our current judicial systems, justice seems to be a core principle at individual and societal levels. However, the gap between the ideal, and let me repeat that, the gap between the ideal and the real in human relations in reference to justice has been nearly impossible to bridge. Nevertheless, not to try to diminish or mitigate this gap is not an option if the value of peace is to be cherished. Um, justice has been at the core of human endeavors in ancient societies. And of course, what could one could uh, mention here, the famous code of Hammurabi and later the well-known treatment of the topic of justice by, Pla by Plato, for example, staging Socrates in the Republic. And these are proof of the perennial quest for justice. Indeed, during the time of Plato, 427 to 347, before the common era, prominent among the key concept ancient Greece was wrestling was that of justice. In fact, the whole book of Republic, as I just mentioned, and the dialogue and analysis therein were about delineating the meaning and reality of justice. Justice was meant actually to save what was considered a decadent society on the verge of imploding at the time. So Plato, in fact, drew an analogy between justice in the human soul and justice in the city or city-state. But briefly, ascertaining the nature and scope of justice first can be helpful. I will talk about righteousness after and talk about the connection and why it is important for our topic in particular. Uh, it has been noted that within the more general literature of justice in international relations, there are basically six approaches that are often identified. What are we really talking about? One, a rights-based approach, which su suggests that we have rights to a stable climate context or relationship. Two, an approach based on responsibility. So those causing a problem have a responsibility to resolve it. Therefore, the need for justice. Three, a utilitarian position, which acts to maximize overall human welfare, which most commonly will involve transferring resources from rich to the poor, for example. Then you have the Kantian cat uh, categorical imperative. Uh, and this, of course, is developed in uh, international justice quite a bit. The Rawlsian position also related to the, pre uh, to the previous one. And also may I just briefly mention here the approach by Brian Berry. Agreements should be negotiated, right? Not under Rawlsian veil of ignorance, but to reach agreements that none could reasonably reject. So negotiation, consultation and so forth. But for our in, uh, interest, and I would like uh, in our contemporary world, it is interesting to see the increasing expansion of the spheres of justice. People now talk about social justice, racial justice, gender justice, climate justice, environmental justice. Why? It is not by chance that uh, the field is expanding. However, Justice and righteousness occupy, and I, I must say this, a central role in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, you would remember, 
Sedek Sedek Tirdov. Key in the in the in the Torah was precisely the in, the institution of just of judges, and uh, they were instructed justice and justice alone, or righteousness and righteousness alone you shall pursue. Tirdov from the root Radaf is not just to pursue; is actually to run after, and we find that like in the Psalm 20, uh, 20, uh, 23, if you allow me, and I hope that uh, Professor Maoz would not correct me, but, uh, but, but uh, think about it. Tov uh, said, So uh, uh, goodness and mercy will run after me. You know, it's like chasing after. So um, uh, interesting. And of course, why not mention here briefly the whole book of the prophet Amos is predicated upon the necessity of having justice and righteousness. Uh, those fa famous words, let justice roll like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. And of course, Martha Luther King used those words also. Uh, he made them very famous, but they were right there in the eighth century because the prophet Amos lived about 760 before the common, uh, before the common era. Now it is interesting that in Amos 5.24, uh, the Lord here indicate that justice and righteousness must be constant in society. Uh, uh, the, actually, the metaphor of running water in particular, uh, the current of a river is contrasted to drought. So justice has to be like running water because without justice, well, life is impossible in, uh, in other words. Without righteousness, life is impossible. Now, then clearly, uh, in the context of Amos, I must also mention that uh, the prophet Amos, without justice and righteousness, religion itself is actually rejected, right? Uh, and obviously, no peace, but judgment and retributive judgment, not distributive judgment as in the form of uh, uh, Sedaka. Let me mention just briefly here that uh, in... Um, uh, also in the Christian scripture, you have this emphasis th the same way, but not just in uh, Judaism or uh, uh, Christianity, but also in Islam, interestingly. Uh, let me just quote one verse of the Quran, for example, where it is said, it is not piety. So the word piety here uh, is taqwa, is also translated as uh, righteousness. So it is not righteousness, that you turn your faces to the east or west in prayer, for example. True righteousness is this, to believe in God, the last day, the angels, the book, the prophets, to give one substance, however cherished to kinsmen and orphan, uh, the needy, the traveler, beggars, to ransom the slave, to perform the prayer, etc. cetera. So in, uh, and let me allow myself to just expand Maybe one example would be sufficient because I'm trying to stay yeah, within I my time. Understand. So, um, uh, 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 I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I need to model what I'm talking about here. So in, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, for example, interestingly, uh, 478 Krishna, right, is uh, reported to say the following. When righteousness is weak and faints, and unrighteousness exalt in pride, then I come to earth. For the salvation of those who are good, for the destruction of evil in men, for the fulfillment of the kingdom of righteousness, I come to this world in the ages that, that pass. So interestingly, the themes of, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita of incarnation, cosmic struggle, the need to preserve righteousness and salvation are all mentioned in this passage as central beliefs in Hinduism, and when we talk about Hinduism, interestingly, that is a Western world word because uh, Hindus do not call themselves Hindus; they call Sanatana Dharma, yeah? Sanatana, right, eternal, everlasting, and then Dharma is sometimes translated as righteousness. Interestingly, so uh, let me move on just to make sure. Uh, that uh, again, I say within my time. If I understand correctly, yeah, I have minutes. until uh, uh, um, ten uh, because 10, I 10, 10, 10. Yeah, Okay, yeah. so ten more minutes. Um, now that would be righteous if I continue. <laughs> to, yeah, okay, sorry. 
Now, you see, what I mentioned about religion is to underline the following, uh, the following. The best in each religion seems to be connected to the fundamental virtue of righteousness. This motif in world religion in particular uh, is even help us to better understand what is what really matters for people. Um, and let me move here to say, okay. But righteousness is inseparable in all these religions that I just mentioned from key concepts such as piety, fear of the Lord, Yerad Adonai, loving kindness, chesed, peace, shalom, and given its various connotation in each tradition, righteousness provides, I believe, an ideal form, a uh, platform rather, to build bridges of shared values and allow the sharing of respective unique perspectives. You see people talk about uh, peace, yes, uh, they are common values that people cherish, you know, helping the poor, but, but righteousness and justice seem to encapsulate a common ground uh, by, uh, by which people can talk to one another and understand what really matters. So, um, a conference such as this one is, to, uh, is meant to encourage people of all faith tradition to live according to the best of their respective traditions. Uh, as Ambassador Bob Seipel, a friend of mine used to say, the best of faith should overcome the worst in religion. And maybe righteousness can be helpful in the process. Obviously, when their profession of faith converge with, with saving lives, showing solidarity, upholding the sacredness of human beings in the name of God, being determined to honor all people, then our peaceful coexistence become a reality. Determined to honor all people. This has been difficult to achieve. Geopolitical rivalries in the building of empires have rocked human history with an incalculable toll of violence and death. This violence is not only found, by the way, unfortunately, in the political world. Even currently, as we speak, internal divisions, rivalries within a same Christian tradition is, for example, a non-negligible factor in the current conflict in Ukraine. Now, people talk about Ukraine, you know, the, 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 the geopolitical aspect, because the word Ukraine means border, by the way. So, Okay, should it stay uh, neutral, demilitarized, and so forth? But there is an undercurrent, undergirding battle, rivalry between Rome. You would be surprised, you know? There was a first Rome in Italy, a second Rome in, in Constantinople. And then when the um, Ottoman Empire conquered Constantinople, right, the Turks, then Rome moved to Moscow, they say, the, a third Rome. But you have two patriarchs, one in, uh, I mean, major, of course, there are 15 autocephalous, uh, you know, uh, entity within the uh, or, uh, Christian or, uh, Orthodox world, but two prominent ones are waging basically a, a fierce rivalry, uh, Kirill, right, uh, patriarch of Moscow, and then Bartolomeo, patriarch of uh, Constantinople, Istanbul right now. So we are not just talking about people with some options, but conflict that somehow feed into geopolitical arena. And we that end up with what, how many displaced people and how many people killed and the war is still going. But to focus on my overarching thematic uh, on righteousness and to state my thesis as clearly as possible, I can say righteousness when envisaged, when envisioned rather from ethical, behavioral, relational, social, judicial, and economic perspective is fundamentally related to favoring, promoting, and sustaining life. 
I mean, this commitment to saving life, promoting life, valuing life, right, is the best in human. But in order to do this, life has to be sacred. I must say, I have been, and uh, Professor Maos allow me to say this, I have been, uh, so but, uh, I know, I know, I know, but just bear with me today, you know. But think about it. Uh, I've been fascinated by, you know, if one person in Israel is missing, a whole nation mobilizes for that one person. That says something about the value of life. So allow me to just mention that passing because it is a testimony of, uh, of, something, of something important. So uh, I would like to just be concrete though, in a sense, um, what happens when there is justice and righteousness? Or rather, let me put it this way. What happens when there is not justice and righteousness? A case study I would like to briefly mention is the book of the prophet Amos. In what is known as the oracles against the nations, the first three chapters the various kinds of injustices described in that book are the following. It, it, it is as if, and this was the eighth century before our common era, but it is as if he's speaking of our world today. Look at the list I have made. Violence was called Hamas in that context of the book of Amos. Population displacement, oracles against the nations. Wars and war crimes at the time. Human trafficking indicted, slavery indicted. This is what happens when there is no justice and righteousness. So let's not even talk about uh, 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 global peace now here because without, when this happens, there's no global peace. There is, I mean, there's no human solidarity. In essence, uh, abuse of, peop of people in vulnerable situations. Uh, uh, border disputes and territorial incursions and annexations. Amos talks about all this. Then uh, atrocity crimes such as murder of pregnant women of Gilead, the prophet said. Killing of infants, genocide because of territorial greed. Eighth century before Christ. Think about, I mean, uh, before our common uh, era. Uh, uh, think about this insensitivity towards the plight and suffering of other nations. It is said that Edom stifled its compassion in that context. Uh, Why convention to, convention to alleviate the plight of the, in, uh, of the innocent, not respected. Assistance to person in danger, neglected. Undignified and dishonorable treatment of dead at the time, yes. Violation of human rights, of course. Ingratitude, right? A corruption of the judicial system. Restriction of freedom of conscience. The prophet is actually threatened <laughs> or uh, 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 coerced not to speak, not to tell the truth. Uh, a priest, um, uh, Amatia, at the time told him not to prophesy, but to go south. I mean, uh, yes, to go south, interestingly. Now, um, and then finally, this pride of prosperity luxurious living while indifferent to the plight of the suffering people, pride of election, false sense of security, immunity, invincibility, impunity, instrumentalization of, religious, of religion, rights and ritual to other end than justice and righteousness. So since my time is over and I will, uh, uh, you know, I have uh, uh, um, uh, develop this in a full article that will be published along the proceedings of this conference. Uh, it's, it's, it's like it's nothing new. If we want global peace, if you want a world with human solidarity, then the virtue of justice and righteousness are paramount. It could not be neglected, but the problem is that many human beings want justice for, for themselves. But how about righteousness, right? Because in righteousness, then you start showing solidarity. You, you, you start taking uh, 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 human beings as valuable, actually. And you start respecting, you start honoring. 
And I think not just to say with lofty aspirational goals, every person at an individual level is called to start <coughs> rediscovering what it means to be righteous. It's not by chance in Israel, there are some, folk, some people who are called the righteous among the Goyim, right? Why? Because they save lives. Think about it. So maybe our dedication to saving lives, improving lives, sustaining lives, that could be a modus operandi that we will all embrace at an individual level, but also societal level. Maybe then we can really build a better world. I apologize for the one minute, but <laughs> Professor Moore spoke okay. maybe one minute <laughs> and I was interrupted another time, right? No. <laughs> but thank you very much for this opportunity for me to share something that I really deeply believe in my heart. And I'm personally committed to, to fight any darkness in me so that uh, th that light of righteousness may also find a way to spread to other people. Thank you very much. Calling uh, our next uh, presentation, uh, presentation, Dr. Adiel Zimran, please. <laughs> Dr. Adiel Zimran, uh, Zimran is a lecturer of mm. and at the Law School of Paris Academic Center and at the Hebrew University. His PhD was written in the Department of Philosophy at the Hebrew, Hebrew University and won a Pines a Prize uh, and the Obach Prize. Uh, in uh, 2016, he was a law clerk in the Supreme Court of Israel. And in the, uh, 2017, he was a postdoctoral teacher at the NYU School of Law. His research focuses on the theory of criminal law Law and religion, and law and, and Jewish uh, philosophy, and I'll let you present your topic for today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Asel, uh, Asher, and uh, Ganu, and uh, Mr. Morcedo, uh, for the uh, fascinating conference. I want to open with a special moment that I had this morning. Uh, just before I left, my junior child, uh, he is five years old, uh, saw a TV show very uh, a famous one, uh, it's called Artu. It's in Hebrew and English in many languages. And the words of the opening song was, each of us is, a spe is special, a bit similar and a bit different. And I thought to myself, this is exactly my lecture today. And this is the concept of this conference. So our conference deals with real supreme values. And if these values appears in an opening song of a TV show for five years old, I think that we have a room for great hope in this context of a building better future. Okay. Uh, my lecture focused on the contribution of theology to the value of human dignity. And this research is part of a broader project in which I seek to examine the potential contribution of theological thinking to liberal theory and in particular to its perception of human and humanity. In this context, I distinguish between the term theology and the broad term of religion. And I'm referring first and foremost to the ontological layer of monotheism. I mean to the existence of a transcendental entity and the implications of this entity for human perception. The motivation for this study is the assumption that even in a secular world, in the sense of what Charles Taylor calls the disenchantment world, a deep understanding of the theological infrastructure is very important for understanding modernity. As Max Weber, Emil Durkheim, Clifford Gertz, Mircea Eliada, and many, many other scholars pointed out, the Western culture was shaped intensively by the monotheistic theology of Abrahamic religions and its way of thinking. So in some senses, understanding, understanding theology of Abrahamic religion is understanding our culture and our way of thinking. Just as in psychology and understanding that childish subconscious is essential and perhaps nece necessary for understanding of the adult person, so also in the study of culture, 
and understanding of the early and immature roots is necessary for understanding of culture. In a previous study, I addressed the question of whether the most central idea in liberal thinking, autonomy, is a necessarily a secular idea and detached from theological roots, as is commonly thought, or theology have a unique contribution to this idea. And I examined this question against the background of two schools of humanism, that of the liberal tradition, I will call it anthropocentric humanism, and that of the theological tradition, I will call it theocentric humanism. Anthropocentric humanism is based entirely of the recognition of subjective man as an autonomous being. And this is what establishes the meaning of his life. As Sartre expressed it, and I quote, man is nothing other than what he makes of himself. Man is responsible for what he is, unquote. Accordingly, it views man's autonomy as the essence of his existence and all the different political structures like state, society, law, and religion are no more than a means to achieve this end. This approach leads to two conclusions. The first one is that no heteronomous factor can restrict man's freedom except for the violation of other people's freedom, very known liberal principle, sometimes known as the principle, harm principle of meal. And the other one is that since autonomy is man's essence, the purpose of social and political institutions is not limited only to protect of citizen negative liberty, but rather they must also increase the extent of his freedom and enable the cultivation and prosperity of autonomy. However, in contrast to the humanistic anthropocentric description, theocentric humanism is based on Abrahamic religion traditions describe man's creation in God's image and hold that although the human was created as a free being, his freedom ought to be restricted by God's command. Abrahamic religions posit God at the center and see him as the purpose of the cosmic order in which also the purpose of human existence is included. According to this religious way of thinking, man must subordinate his will to the theological purpose dictated by God and conquer his own personal aspirations. According to this view, God is the source of all norms and commandments, while man is obliged to obey his words. This description does not follow only from the gap between man and God, but also from the religious order of the cosmos, where God and not man is the purpose of existence. The very basic structure that emerge in all Abrahamic religions as reflected in many, many of the public, biblical narratives, the circle of God's command, the will of man, then <laughs> sin, afterward punishment and atonement, reflects the constant tension between God's authority and man's authentic will. The dependence of liberty on the recognition of the value of autonomy made philosophers such Russell, Sartre, and many others claim that man's liberty cannot be founded on the theocentric humanism. And that is why in order to obtain liberty, a person must free himself from the religious tradition that bases his uniqueness on his creation in the divine image. As Russell phrased it, and I quote, the whole conception of God is conception derived from ancient oriental despotism. It is a conception quite unworthy of a free man, unquote. The purpose of my research is not to refute the existence of two different humanistic traditions, which assign different meanings to man's autonomy and freedom. Rather, my goal is to draw a general outline of theological status of autonomy in the humanistic theocentric tradition. As part of this, I examine the question of whether it is possible, despite the dichotomous description presented by Sartre and Russell and others, to find the theological structures that recognize the value of autonomy within the theocentric humanism that characterizes religious traditions. 
I explore this question in the light of the different interpretations of man's creation in the image of God and the sin of primordial man. According to the common monotheistic worldview, the fact that God reveals himself, communicates with humans and commands them, testifies that he has a will, not only a will regard to himself and to the world, but also with regard to the behavior of human. On the one hand, this description goes hand in hand with Russell's description of the heteronomous entity that restricts and even denies a person liberty. However, according to some medieval theologians, the primordial man reflects that man's likeness to God lies in the fact that, that like God who act according to his own will and out of absolute freedom, also the human has a will and the ability to choose and decide autonomously. In this interpretation, the primordial sin does not reflect only the subordination of the man to the God, but also, and more dramatically, expresses the tension between the will of man and the will of God. The circle that I mentioned already, the divine command, the will of man, sin and atonement, which is described in the biblical story, reflects two central phenomena of human existence. One is the fact that man is endowed with a will of his own, which moves him to act by internal motives rather than external directives. And the other is that man is inclined to recognize the existence of external ideals that dictate the appropriate way for him to realize the freedom of choice and granted him and to direct his will toward the implementation of these ideals. The sin of primordial man did not reject the divine command completely, but rather confronted it. Before, both before and after the sin, human examines their will while comparing it to the divine command. The religious circle does not hide the fact that man has the will of his own and it recognizes the value of, of acting freely. However, the religious command rejects the relativistic view according to which man's way of realizing his freedom is neutral and indifferent and hold that man must realize his freedom by choosing the right action. The fact that the Bible open with a story about sin and disobedience toward the divine command and not with a story about man's obedience toward God emphasizes the two vectors of human deeds. On the one hand, man is endowed with a will to act freely in accordance with his own internal inclinations, even against the explicit command of God. This is the internal vector. But on the other hand, man knows intuitively that the freedom granted him is not an expression of relativism and that some actions are preferable to others since they are prescribed by the external ideals which are not dictated by him. This is the external vector. In more than one senses, also in modern liberal discourse, two similar vectors can be identified. As Isaiah Berlin so finely has put it, the term liberty has two distinctive meanings, negative liberty, which frees men completely from external and political restraints and positive liberty, which is man's ability to freely define the purpose of his life and his subjective idea of good, which guides his to choice and, and actions. Many political philosophers hold that only the positive kind of liberty enables the, the subject to live a fully autonomous life. And the more dominance is granted to the negative type, the more the autonomy of the individual is endangered. At the basis of this approach lies the assumption that human autonomy does not depend only on internal factors, but necessarily emerges from a dialogue between the subject and his environment and external values. This means 
that a fully neutral environment harms the ability of subject to realize his positive liberty and autonomy. According to, this, to these philosophers, it is only the meeting between the inner world of the subject, internal vector, and external ideals and values, external, external vector, which enable him to realize his autonomy in life's different areas. In this context, the, phenomen the phenomenological similarity on the tension between the will of God and the will of man, as described in the story of the scene of the primordial man, to modern dis discussions on the connection between negative and positive liberty may teach an important lesson about the structure of human autonomy. As a follow-up to this study, in my current research, I seek to examine the potential contribution of theology to human dignity. The concept human dignity has many meanings in different areas of knowledge, ethics, politics, theology, and law. Like the two traditions of humanism, also here some thinkers believe that the idea originated in Abrahamic religions according to which man was created in the image of God, and <clears throat> this is what justifies the duty of human dignity. And some emphasizes its secular roots connecting its creation of man's liberation from all kinds of theologian, theological and metaphysical essentialism <clears throat> in the age of enlightenment. At any rate, the term, no doubt, derived its normative contemporary meaning from the, from the declaration of the United Nations after the Second World War, which in its first paragraph determined the right of all human beings to dignity. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. In the wake of this declaration, the European Court of Human Rights adopted human dignity as a constitutional value and several states adopted the term into their binding law system, granting it constitutional status, Israel, Germany, North Africa, and others. Human dignity is a term with substantive meaning, which touches upon the question of man's uniqueness and the border between human beings and animals. This is in contrast to the term human rights, which despite the vagueness of its meaning and scope is normative positive expression that defines a system <clears throat> of basic rights to which every person is entitled by virtue of his being human. A substantial part of the research of human dignity focuses on historical and sociological aspect of the term dignity, like very known, Kamir, Nussbaum, <clears throat> etc. However, I want to focus on the term man and on the question which stratum in man justifies relating to him with dignity. In another place, I demonstrated that it is possible to point out at least two different strata, each of which generates the term human dignity in different way. One is man as an object who belongs to the category of the human race, who is entitled to spatial treatment by virtue of this belonging to this specific group. The other is man as a subject distinguished from his affiliation with any kind of group, even the group of human beings, because he is a unique individual. Here I want to examine the question of whether theology may have the potential to unique contribution to the subjective value of man's dignity. My main thesis is that by recognition of the concept of the infinite attributed to God, theology can make makes room for multiple individuals of substantive value and grant an ontological foundation for the real existence of the individual subject. I want to begin with a very short comparison between the changes <clears throat> that have occurred in the attitude of the neutral sciences toward object in the wake of the Copernican revolution and Kantian ethics. As known in the Aristotelian view, object has an essence which enable imminent and intrinsic motion like the heavenly bodies. While the scientific views that arose in the wake of the Copernican revolution differentiated the motion from the object and view it merely as a priori, a phenomenon. Many scholars have pointed out the, co the connection between the Copernican revolution in the neutral sciences and the Kantian revolution that took place in the 
areas of epistemology and ethics. And even Kant himself has pointed it out in some places. Like the Copernican revolution, which viewed all the movements of the heavenly bodies as the expression of a single abstract law, Kant, the Kantian project intended to disconnect human moral from the limitations of the senses and to enable the discovery of a metaphysical and universal law. Like the physical law of nature in the area of ethics, Kant adopted the universal law as a guiding principle to determine what the proper deed is. On this background, Kantian philosophy constitutes the intellectual foundation for modern political outlook, which are based primarily on the abolishment of essentialism element and the adoption of the principle of equality of all human beings. However, despite the political advantages of Kant ethics, it restrained in many senses the humanistic trend that began in the Renaissance, which stressed the unique element in every human being while the humanism of the Renaissance wished to separate man from the world of nature and to emphasize his being a unique substance who must actualize his inherent potential and express himself, Kantian philosophy, in many senses, viewed the subject merely as individual case of universal principle, according to which man is a rational autonomous being. This is the reason why Kantian ethics did not focus on man and his character characteristics, but rather on the abstract deed. This is also the reason why some thinkers somewhat unexpectedly hold that it was Kantian ethics in particular that led the, human <clears throat> the humanistic crisis that reached its peak in the world wars of the 20th century. Last Last. In this context, I want to offer through an analysis of the writings of Hermann Cohen, that the metaphysical assumption about the existence of transcendental being may grant substantive value to the normative and philosophical count of the dignity, of the human dignity. Hermann Cohen was one of the founder of new Kantian philosophy, which tried to revive idealistic thought. In the beginning, Cohen thought that religion does not have an independent existence. And the reason is that rational thinking converts religion into ethics. But in his last work, Religion of Reason, out of sources of Judaism, Cohen dealt with the role of religion as the object of philosophical investigation and pointed out its importance for the completion of the ethical domain. According to Cohen, the Kantian project cannot provide a metaphysical expl explanation and an ontological foundation for the differences between human beings. Cohen thinks that only a metaphysical and transcendental being of God may grant a philosophical rational foundation for the uniqueness of the subject, that subject is not a phenomena of a general law, but a re revelation of an infinity entity. Thank you, Dr. Zumar, for a very interesting lecture, right on time. <laughs> and I, I would like to present our Third uh, speaker, Professor Pascual Alikino. I'm saying it right. Okay. Uh, so a few words of introduction. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Alikino in 2020 and 2021 uh, taught global law and religion and religion at Central European University Vienna and in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he has been a, a, an adjust professor at, a, of law at a BYU. A J. Ruben Clark Law School and at St. John's University, University, University School of Law. He is a member of the Italian Council of the Relationships with Muslim Communities and is the author of Law and International Religious, Religious Freedom, The Rise and Decline of the American Model. He has published widely in journals uh, such as Oxford Journal, of Law and Religion, First Amendment Law Review, George Washington International Law Review, European Public Law Review, Review of Faith and International Affairs. And I will let you present your topic today. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. So one thing I can promise I will be on time because I am uh, what separates you from the first break of the morning, which is very important, especially when you start early. So uh, allow me to spend uh, two minutes of my 15 minutes 
uh, to thank some people and organization which uh, brought us together because i mean you said also that uh, in the kind of meetings that we had is the, the, the importance of the real encounter between people uh, and i think after the two years that we have had uh, i mean for me it's very important to be present and talk to people and share hands with people uh, when you discuss uh, important topics like this one because sometimes we we think that uh, we might be discussing a little bit ideas which are in the peruranium, no? Uh, especially sometimes when uh, uh, we talk to our colleagues, which are, you know, hard staff, black letter lawyers, which discuss. But uh, I always say that uh, we should never forget that uh, ideas have consequences. The fact that uh, thousand years ago, somebody realized that the fact that uh, individuals are created in the image of God that was an idea, and that had a terrific effect all over the world. Uh, and so this is important why we discuss the topics that we discussed in the first session, uh, with both the, con the both contribution that we've heard. Um, I'm trying, uh, what I will do today, uh, I will bring you a particular perspective, because in the title of the meetings that uh, our organizers, which I thank all of them again, I don't need to mention them because they are, uh, of course, uh, in the flyer here, uh, you have religions and solidarity and global peace. So I understood it as uh, the kind of role that uh, different re religious tradition can play in this. Uh, and Ganun said that sometimes we also see religious traditions which uh, deliberately decided not to play this role, unfortunately. Uh, so I will bring you something from my own personal religious tradition. I'm, I'm Catholic, raised in Italy. So the assumption is that uh, you are Catholic. Actually, I have to appreciate that uh, when your assumption is that uh, you are Catholic, actually, I have to appreciate that uh, when you are in Israel, uh, you see you see that uh, people, whatever their background, are taking religion seriously. So whether they are believer, non-believer, they understand because of the heritage, because their culture, that religion is important. Uh, I don't take this for granted. Uh, if you go in many academic settings, especially in Western Europe, this might be also the case in the US, if you start talking about religion issues, they, they look at you as a little bit uh, wired person, because they say, well, why is this relevant, you know? And then you realize that that is a provincial approach, because wherever you go in the world, where you go to, I, I taught in Rio de Janeiro for two, for two years uh, for, as a visiting professor, you don't understand Brazil today if you don't know the role of religion in the country. Uh, if you go to India, you don't understand the country if you don't know the role of Hinduism in the Indian culture and in Indian policy. If you go to Indonesia, you don't understand Indonesia if you don't know anything about Islam. The same if you go to China. If you go to China, you don't understand what is going on in China if you don't realize how afraid is the Chinese Communist Party of the rise of certain religions in the country. Uh, I don't need to explain to the people sitting at this table why religions are important uh, in your society. And so I'm very happy to be in the great state of Israel. So thank you very much for inviting us. So I gave uh, uh, to the title of my presentation, Religions and Human Solidarity in the Tragedy of Troyway Culture. Uh, Troyway culture is an expression which has risen over the past few years in uh, Catholic discussions because Pope Francis referred to the notion of throwaway cultures in several instances, in several speeches. Uh, and then of course, those of you who want to read probably what is the most important document that the Pope published on that, uh, is published in English, it's almost 200 pages. Uh, but I know that you are very learned scholars, so you will find a lot of uh, uh, ideas in the encyclical Laudato Si that the Pope uh, published a few years ago. So I'm going to refer uh, to that document just to share in the last 10 minutes, which I have uh, uh, to some of the ideas uh, which are present in this conversation and why they might be relevant for us uh, these days. So probably not uh, all of you are familiar with the concept of throwaway culture. Of course, as I said, I will not have the time to fully analyze the genealogy and implication of the concepts, which will be present in the written uh, paper which I will um, send to Ganun, but I would like to offer some rhapsodic remarks and reflection that could be used as food of thought for our conversation and encounter. 
the notion of throwaway culture has first received public attention, attention when it was discussed by Pope Francis in a January 2014 address to the members of the diplomatic corp uh, accredited by the OEC. The idea was originally defined as a mindset in which food, disposable objects, and even human beings are discarded as unnecessary. So this is the first uh, word that you might want to remember, the association of uh, an individual and being unnecessary. And you can already see uh, a kind of uh, dark contrast there. Of course, a typical example that was also mentioned by Ganun, when you see how people are killed, deported in a war, you can immediately associate the human being and the unnecessary, or how a human being is perceived as an unnecessary. Uh, concrete examples which were made by the Pope are usually the use of children as soldiers. Of course, the huge debate of abortion that is present in many faith and religious tradition, and then human trafficking. Uh, the course, uh, of course, this concept uh, of throwaway culture was also adapted to describe environmental degradation, which has been one of the, of the main lenses through which that document has been read globally. But as I want to stress today, that is the, not the only paradigm through which we have to read the Laudato Si. Of course, there is a discussion on environmental justice, and that's a big part of that. But if you read between the lines, it's even bigger than that. And there is a whole moral paradigm, paradigm present in that document, which was released um, by the Pope. The concept of throwaway culture was further expanded and solidified as a moral paradigm in the 2015 encyclical Laudato Si, where the Pope criticizes the excess of consumerism and power derived by, from technology, which according to him, has profoundly negative and lasting effect on all the God's creation, including both the natural environment and human life. If we have to follow uh, the presentation that we have heard before, this is a typical example of theocentric reading of, of reality. So with the external constraints of how individuals make their own decisions. So that's the, the theoretical paradigm through which this document is coming to you, of course. Now, as I stressed again, environment has been for many, the most natural framework to which uh, the encyclical has been read and understood. I want to stress once again, that for me, especially in this setting, that is not the most important paradigm, but we have to enlarge our point of view on the encyclical. In fact, uh, from a theoretical point of view, one of the main points which is important to stress is the link that the Pope acknowledged, the undeniable link that the Pope acknowledgement and connection between the respect of the natural world and the dignity of the human person. So again, this goes back to the presentation that we have heard uh, before. But there is more. For instance, Pope Francis writes, uh, and I quote, a sense of deep communion with the rest of nature cannot be real if our hearts lack tenderness, compassion, and concern for our fellow human beings. The concept of throwaway culture is therefore calling for a culture of encounter. Uh, this stresses the, my initial remarks of the importance of being present with people and encountering people, to share things with people. Uh, and this is, there is, of course, a strong critique. The Pope has often made remarks and critiques to this uh, uh, culture of uh, consumeristic innovation uh, and technology which say, think, uh, that let people think that they are together, but in effect they are not. And this is not just to criticize many good innovation which have helped us in the pandemic, but the point is that they should not uh, be the default option of how human encounter is lived. And I have to say of also how academic encounter is, uh, is lived. <clears throat> so the concept of throwaway culture calls for a uh, culture of encounter, which ensures that personal outreach and meeting between individuals in a rejection of the societal mindsets, which often treats human beings as discardable. Now, this moral paradigm uh, that you can find if you read the 200 pages of the Laudato Si encyclical has, of course, uh, I think, important uh, uh, policy and uh, theoretical implication for policymakers and lawyers. Uh, together, and uh, we can find, of course, food for thought, food, food for thought there. Pope Francis has often offered an understanding of rights able to resist throwaway culture, the way in which we theorize rights. And again, this goes back to the previous presentation, you know, 
is are individual totally free to make their own decision based on their own assumption and they're totally free of external constraints whether good or bad or not the pope has often offered some remarks on this which are very important i think for instance if you take the pope speech to the european parliament 2014 he stressed how i'm quoting today there is a tendency to claim even broader individual rights i am tempted to say individualistic underlying this is a conception of the human person as detached from all social and anthropological contexts as if the person were a monad increasingly unconcerned with other surrounding monads you see the first remarks which i made ideas have consequences the way in which you theorize the place of individuals vis-a-vis -vis society as important theoretical consequences in the way in which you theorize rights and for instance in the decision of courts because when you get court decision let's say on the principle of individual autonomy the way in which you theorize that autonomy is not coming from the, from nowhere it's coming from abstract ideas of the individual and society and so it's important to have meetings like like those one so the equally essential and complementary concept of duty no longer seems to be linked to a, to a concept of rights like this one. What is the result of this theoretical approach then? The Pope says, as a result, the rights of the individual are upheld without regard for the fact that each human being is part of a social context wherein his or her rights and duties are bound up with those of others and with common good itself. You know, the debate of the common good, which is key to Catholic social doctrine, uh, has often, often disappeared. From, from our public debates, uh, especially in the Western world. For Pope Francis, it is therefore vital, and I'm quoting again, again, to develop a culture of human rights which wisely links the individual, or better, the personal aspect, to that of the common good the, of the all of us made up of individuals, families, and intermediate groups who together constitute society. This necessary connection between individual groups uh, and, society at, and society at large are embedded, uh, are bring the Pope to reflect on what, according to him, is the most severe disease that Europe, and I would say probably the Western world, face today, which is not the pandemic, but is loneliness. Loneliness in this construction of rights is the most severe disease that many of our societies are living. And loneliness creates also other kinds of pandemics, also psychological pandemics. And loneliness creates people which are unnecessary in society because they are left alone whether they are sick people or they are just people which are left alone for any other reason for Pope francis therefore human life is grounded in three fundamental a closely intertwined relationship the first relation is the relationship with god which was what we have heard in our previous presentation then is this relationship with our neighborhood and then with the earth itself you can see the three paradigms here of which the environmental paradigm is only one of the three. According to the Bible, the Pope says, three, these three vital relationships have been broken both outwardly and within us. The, rap the rapture of these three relationships, the Pope says, is sin. You see, it's a whole moral paradigm coming through the readings of the Pope. At this point, I think it's easy to understand how and why throwaway culture is both a tragedy or can be both a tragedy in his, in, in his own right but it's also a symptom of a larger problem for humanity and here it doesn't matter if you are catholic if you are jew if you are muslim or if you are a non-believer this is of course in the great uh, i would say uh, catholic tradition of natural law you don't need to be catholic to discuss natural law because natural law is coming as a discussion of any individual whether whatever is his personal belief. So what is important to stress is that for Francis, the notion of throwaway culture is an encompassing moral paradigm, which acknowledges the importance of the human person, especially when he or she uh, is most vulnerable. What is at the center of the problem is the mentality that leads to discarding of the human person. And Pope Francis make an effort to identify the root causes as a systematic failure to recognize in the intimate human dignity of a human person, a dignity that is unique to the human person created in the image and likeness of God, which is the opening remark which I made to you. And you know, this is an idea. There were people thousand years ago which did not believe that images were created to the image of God, and that, for instance, would justify killing people. Because if a person is not created at the image of God, then what is preventing you to kill that person, you know? 
the simple idea that the human being is created in the image of God then creates a barrier, for instance, to the killing of a fellow human being. You see how ideas can be powerful from theology to criminal law than to human rights today. So the concept of Troy culture is an overarching theme and should be particularly relevant for those with responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the others. It has also implication for the situation that we are facing today. Why? Because for instance, victims, victims of war are typical, a, a typical example of these debates. Pope Francis writes, every conflict and war is emblematic of the throwaway culture, since people's lives are deliberately crushed by those in power. Now, I don't need to explain to you how we could apply uh, these remarks today, uh, not to a specific situation, because there are many situations uh, like this one all over the world. I believe that this concept of or moral paradigm of throwaway culture could be uh, of particular relevance for lawyers. We could ask ourselves uh, or what every new law decision discards and throws away. Why, who does it treat as less worthy of protection or dignity? This is a, uh, we can say it's an impact assessment analysis uh, of new legislation based on the moral paradigm of throwaway culture. Uh, would be very interesting to develop something systematic through which we analyze new legislation based uh, on this paradigm. So the real stress here is on moving beyond personal conversion or a focus of the individual. You know, many times uh, we as low religion scholars, we have taught, you know, discussion on freedom of religion have been focused on individual choice and conversion as if individuals just, you know, can make up your mind or whatever and, and are totally free from external constraints. Of course, I would subscribe right now to the statement that says every individual is free to choose his own religion or belief. For sure, that's part of Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we know that there are people persecuted all over the world for, you know, for converting to another religion. And we should be aware of that. But we, when we as scholars analyze these debates, probably we don't have to pretend that everything is just made up of individual choice. But as a, a famous Italian politician said uh, 30 years, 40 years ago, things are a little bit more complex than that. Uh, and I think that we should bear that uh, in mind. So, uh, so in this act of reorientation and attention to the bonds between groups and individual, uh, we have to develop uh, this relationship in a way that uh, to discard each other will become unthinkable. As Pope Francis writes, it's very important to strengthen the bonds, social, personal, family bonds. Everybody needs an appropriate setting and truly human habitat with suitable conditions for their harmonious personal development and for their integration into the greater habitat of society. It is only through strong and vibrant local communities and familial bonds that there can be multiple safety nets to prevent the weakest among us from being discarded intentionally or unvertedly. Laudato Si can be read from different perspectives, as I said. However, I think that the most profound message call, calls to move forward towards a future where throwaway, throwaway culture is discarded and replaced with hope, love, and human dignity. Thank you very much for your attention. very much for this very interesting uh, lecture. Yesterday we had the chief rabbi, today we have the Pope. Uh, <laughs> and uh, now we will open the uh, uh, for, for question and for discussion. I suggest uh, that we collect a few questions and then uh, the speakers uh, would answer them. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, thank you all. I love the way that they interacted and some of the ideas sort of built on each other. It was just fascinating. Um, but it raises some questions for me that, you know, I, I, I really just don't know. Um, for Benun, there's a question you talked about converging views of righteousness that can bring us together. But the question is, well, what if our views of righteousness diverge in ways that don't cause us to care for other people? Um, it's nice to assume that righteousness always will, but um, I think history shows that it doesn't always. And then this question you talk about the communal version of autonomy, you know, this ties in, right? How does that play out? Um, it, I, I, 
I'm fascinated by the idea, and I just love to sort of see where you go next with. Oh, okay. Did you fall? Oh. Up there. <laughs> so, uh, and with Pasquale, I sort of tying in with this as well. Um, I, I like the way you're going with the sense that we focus over much on individual autonomy and sort of value of theocratic views. Uh, how, do you, how do you handle, I know there's a fair amount of skepticism among sort of people who are less inclined to be religious of the value of religious views in cabining and shaping individual autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you take that on? So, sorry, that was two questions, not one. <laughs> Did you want to ask? She's collected. Uh, another, another few questions. Two related notes. One to um, um, uh, Dr. Zimran. I'm kind of jealous of the Christians because uh, when we, uh, when we're trying to promote uh, what you call um, uh, theocentric humanism, uh, we quote Herman Cohn, and then, this is nice, but then you, we can see the Pope himself promoting uh, theocentric humanism uh, publicly, uh, uh, de clearly, deeply. Uh, just a note, I, I, I wish we had such religious leaders in our times in Judaism that would, uh, uh, would you know, discuss uh, uh, how to promote humanism through uh, theological thinking explicitly and not, you know, by verses quoted uh, uh, and, and, uh, here and there. Uh, now, now about throwaway culture itself, I, I wonder, the, the, the two versions uh, of, of humanism, at least two versions, uh, ideologically uh, depart and historically depart. One is the 14th century, 15th uh, century of classical humanism, uh, which means more or less that any human being enjoys the agape of God and, and uh, this is, let's call it classical humanism. And there is the 18th century enlightenment humanism, which is different because, because it's based on rationalism. I'm not sure about throwaway culture where it stands. It, it, as, it, as I understand it, 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 it means that uh, Catholic Church moved toward the Renaissance of the 14th or 15th century, 14th in Italy, uh, 15th century elsewhere. Uh, but, but, uh, but I'm not sure whether it goes to the Enlightenment, whether it goes to acknowledging rationality as, as you know, as a basis of, 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 of the way we conceptualize uh, man and God and, 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 and society. Thank you. Okay, you're invited to answer. Oh, I didn't see. Okay. Um, it's very interesting how the talks interface my talk as you'll see. Um, in answer to what you just said, there is Stalinist X, and uh, theology yeah. has its own dangers when it becomes doctrinal, which Judaism has never been. Um, I want to introduce a third topic here that I'm American, I've lived in Israel now for many years, but I'm very tied to the American discourse and the classic distinction that you've made so well between uh, atavistic individualism as liberal and how do you do a theocentric that acknowledges a kind of liberty. But in America today, there's a third category which is a kind of fluid selfhood that is open to uh, anti-institutional, uh, anti-categories, ra radical emancipation is claimed to be, I think, very dissociated from social context, but claiming to be, in fact, representing social context. 
I find it a very uh, incoherent but powerful discourse that's running uh, the academic discourses in America. So I just want to ask yeah. people to think about this third category, not of the individual and not of the socially engaged as uh, in Eurocentric terms, but as the fluid, emancipated Judith Butler <laughs> self, which is the most powerful self discourse in America that creates these encounters. I think, just to introduce that. It's, uh, it's a professor, yeah. They're stronger than us. <laughs> What, what I can say that I, I take your word, this idea do work. How, how it will uh, become a policy, uh, uh, I think that we, we don't know. Uh, our goal is to uh, think how to develop the idea and hope that the <coughs> policymakers will take them and think how to take them and make uh, a, a, a real politics uh, in, our, uh, in our life. Uh, that they have to, to answer to a, a question. What uh, Ron said, I'm not sure that I totally agree with the dis distinction between religious thinking and rational thinking. I'm not sure that yeah. this this uh, a, a line or, or border that you try to put is very exactly and. No, this is exactly. Surely, in the 19th not century, I think that the scholars thought like that, but I think that today it's not a so common. A, a I, I didn't want to, to, to put it as a, as a contrast to, to the contrary, but I mean, I mean you, you, you can think of humanism as, as, as aimed not only at, at, at uh, mercy for every human being or or, uh, or 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 love or or being created in god's image but also as a uh, 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 thinking as rationality as, as the main uh, uh, characteristic of, of of human society but take take what a uh, uh, pascal said about the idea of the uh, human created in the image of God. This is a religious idea or rational idea? How, can, how, how do you categorize it's, this idea? It's, it's, uh, it's vague and I mean, it's vague and it, it was transformed into a more distilled idea during the 18th century. Okay. That's my point. Transformation and interpretation, this is the, the device that we should use to take the religious idea and to, to, to make them rational. Mm -hmm. No, no, go you have a point of order on this? Or? <laughs> no, no, I was going to reply to my question. So, okay. All right. oh. I come back to um, what Elizabeth yeah, um, mentioned. What if there is an eclectic understanding of righteousness? How does it work, basically? Well, uh, it happens that, um, you know, like the, the, the religious traditions I mentioned, there is consensus, unanimity. And I think I try to narrow it down to say, respect for human life, uh, the sanctity of life. Um, uh, I don't think there is really much um, divergence in terms of the understanding of what right is. The aspiration uh, to justice, for example, and that's why I mentioned since the dawn of civilization, we have this um, a quest for justice. And I, uh, and I added from the um, Judeo tradition in particular, the idea of not just justice, but um, coupled with righteousness, why these two together? But I think there is a deeper problem, of what I call uh, a deficit in credibility. And, and I think this is where the, boom, like now you mentioned uh, throwaway culture. Um, yes, you know, like, uh, and it's not a new phenomenon. 
we forget we are living in a context of, uh, let's say, the past 600 years of basically uh, European domination about the world, okay? So that's our context, even our intellectual context also. Uh, you see, re religions have discredited themselves to a large degree. When you really look at why in France in 1905, they decided to just uh, shake off the yoke of ecclesiastical domination. So it's, uh, there is a context and not just, uh, you see, so again, our discourse today is uh, fragile because of our history. That's why I talk about a deficit of credibility somehow. Yes, we hear the Pope, uh, we hear, uh, you know, religious leaders saying things today, but still, uh, you know, since the Enlightenment, I mean, and, uh, people are, are remembering, you know, the Qatar and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the um, fusion of religion and, uh, you know, the state uh, and so forth. Instrumentalization of religion and instrumentalization of the state. And this is even happening today as we speak, you know, I mean, uh, what is happening in uh, in uh, Ukraine can be explained somehow. So, and I think this is what makes our discourse difficult, you know. But again, to say, okay, let's not just um, stay at the at the level of sem of symptoms, but what is what are the root causes that is taking us right now to where we are, and what can be done? And and I think by mentioning the issue of righteousness. Uh, uh, and uh, and you know connecting it to the uh, to the issue of life, the respect of life, and of course in that uh, same vein, human dignity. Uh, now this human dignity can be connected to uh, a theocentric humanism, of course, human beings created in the uh, image of God, right? And if that is taken seriously, actually the whole religious ethos is what you do to a human being you do to God. And that is because of the act of solidarity that God chose to human. But I think again, the, the, the public space is an area where uh, they, there must be a restoration, uh, right? Of our credibility. What are we talking about? Because history we have proven that in fact, we have chosen the ways of violence instead of the ways of peace. And I think that, creates, you know, and of course, uh, what you were saying, uh, if I may just add this footnote, a throwaway culture is basically everything is for sale. <laughs> I mean, and then now when people start saying, okay, if everything is for sale, uh, then I can conquer, of course, to take resources is, is, is you know, I mean, uh, <laughs> and it takes us to another, to another issue of our world today, if there is no infinite dignity, well, then there's no infinite value, but then people are disposable, no question. And if people are disposable, well, uh, and someone like me, I come, uh, you know, I was just uh, telling Paolo the other day, uh, my family tr traces back to 1440, somewhere around there. And that is when the Portuguese landed, you know, in the uh, coast of West Africa. I was born in Senegal. You know, uh, uh, so interestingly, when I hear this course, you know, uh, uh, I am thinking, okay, wow, my whole generational trajectory has been de defined, determined by throwaway people. <laughs> you know, it's not just a culture. You, you're talking about, you know, conquering people, taking their resources, altering forever. You know, but still, there is room today, today, to rediscover the importance of human beings. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for the remarks and the question. Let me start with a sociological note. So the sociological note which I want to make, we have had two remarks uh, from two people which work a lot with the US, I assume, which are Elizabeth and uh, our Shira. Shira. Sorry, I didn't remember your name. So both Elise, Elizabeth and Shira uh, have made some uh, remarks on a critical issue. So 
people which criticize a theocentric, uh, you know, approach, as we have discussed it, because Elizabeth has in mind, of course, the culture wars in the US. Uh, and I mean, this is not by chance, the two remarks are both coming from there. As somebody who has been teaching and researching in the US, uh, there is a specific uh, geopolitical, uh, sociological dimension to that. Uh, actually, I'm happy to share an article which I wrote for the Cambridge University Press uh, book a couple of years ago on the geopolitic, geopolitical dimension of lower religion debates, for those of you who have an interest. Because the US are the epicenter uh, of uh, culture wars today, uh, they've been experiencing uh, internal culture wars. Uh, I mean, the debates on the, the Supreme Court decision of, of ab on abortion is just uh, since a few days ago. Uh, but there is a new step in that, which I believe is very important, is that the, the US culture wars are going global, uh, exactly with the same kind of uh, intellectual infrastructure. You don't understand the position of the Russian Orthodox Church and the reconstruction, and Elizabeth can confirm that. Uh, the, what Putin is thinking today about uh, Russia, Russia, the role of orthodoxy, if you don't understand American evangelicals, the influence of American conservative evangelicals on the Russian Orthodox Church is clear. You don't understand what is going on in certain African countries today if you don't understand American culture wars. I mean, I taught global law and religion last year at the Central European University. I had students from uh, Guinea or uh, other states, and they were telling me, oh, but we are having debates uh, on same-sex marriage constitutional amendments, all the legal counsel are coming from the US. Uh, you know, uh, and it's the same for many debates uh, in Europe today, because the US, you know, it's like Hollywood. The, mo the model that we have to use to approach this uh, uh, cultural issue is to use the Hollywood model, because we, Hollywood has been shaping Im imaginaries all over the world. Now we have, uh, cultural legal fights in the US, which are shaping legal imaginaries all over the world. If we don't have that framework in mind, we don't understand what is happening in our societies. Now, I'm not giving a value judgment on that. Uh, if you want, we can, I, I have a value judgment on that, uh, but I'm, I'm giving you the picture, okay? I'm giving you what I think are the facts, because before we analyze it, we need to get the facts right uh, and the framework right. And I think this is the framework. And I've been working on this framework over the past few years to try to connect the dots on what is going on globally. Frankly, you don't understand Bolsonaro and the role of religion in Brazil if you don't understand the connection between Bolsonaro, Brazil, and also American evangelicals in that context. Yeah. May I just add? Yeah. But um, the question, though, at, uh, attached to that is why is that so? I think. It is connected to empire building. You know, every empire, uh, you know, driven society in history wanted to also have a global. So there's like the whole ecosystem of meaning, culture, fashion, and so is driven by the most powerful nation. It has been the norm in history. Well, you know, as, as, a so, Catholic, as a Catholic, I believe in complex oppositorum. Mm -hmm. And in the complex, and I think that there is not a single variable to explain Correct. to Correct. explain things. So that's a political analysis which might be part of the matrix. Mm -hmm. But I think that theology, for instance, is also part of the matrix. No question. Besides uh, politics of power. So if you look at why certain religious groups have been fighting cases before the European Court of Human Rights, okay, let me play the lawyers' game. Now, for years, especially after the end of the nineties to today, if you look at the data and you see the NGOs which are involved in litigation before the European Court of Human Rights, and you look at the numbers, okay? You realize why 20% of NGOs are coming from the US to litigate in Europe? They are not Europeans. What's the issue there? And you understand what is going on. Two elements. First of all, theological elements. There are certain American religious groups which think that Europe has been secularized. The way to rewin Europe to God is to litigate cases before the European Court of Human Rights, Human Rights as they have been litigating cases before the US Supreme Court, which to me as a Catholic is totally not, because you don't change society by litigating cases and winning cases. Mm. 
because as a Catholic, I believe that you change society, you know, waking up in the morning, knocking the next door, and changing art and minds of people one by one. You cannot change society in a Leninist faction through using the court as a tool to reshape society. That can be influential, but I, as a Catholic, I have to say, sorry, I think it's not enough. Then there is, of course, in the case of the US organization, the legal element. When the US Supreme Court in 2003, in the case of Flores versus Texas, declared that Texas sodomy laws were unconstitutional, he did so by quoting a president of the European Court of Human Rights. You see how our traditional legal black letter approach is not able to explain what is going on. You know. There is no legal doctrine that can explain to you why a US court is quoting a president from a European Court of Human Rights, which is not, which is not bound to quote, and then is declaring uh, a law in Texas unconstitutional. If you, Texas, uh, Lawrence v. Texas is the case that they, they, they can explain a lot of decision that we have had from the US Supreme Court today. If you read the dissenting opinion by Justice Scalia in that case, you realize that he saw what were the cultural implications of that case uh, from 2003 and then to the Obergefell decision and to many other decisions. So, you know, you need to have uh, to cultural matrix to understand the law and position it in the context there. Of course, the cultural matrix in the context of fluidism is, is there. Now, I am not, I don't want to quote the, the word that Pope Francis used to, Pope Francis in the imaginary today is understood as a progressive pope, okay? So I invite you to do a little research and see what Pope Francis has said and written about these debates on uh, gender, on fluidism and so on, because the words are too strong. I, I, I don't want to say it here without quoting them. So uh, if you have an interest in these debates, go there and see what uh, the Pope has said about these debates. And uh, I mean, uh, the, the question that you made, I mean, on the other side, uh, Pope Ratzinger is often understood to be a staunch conservative Pope. The fact is that Pope Ratzinger has often said, coming from this German uh, traditional right. intellectual debates and all the Habermas debates on the role of religion in public life and rationality and religion, I mean, in Catholic theological culture is settled that uh, rationality and religion are together and you cannot uh, just oppose them and have them in conflict. You are religion because you, you are religious because you are rational and you participate to the public debate on the religious ground with rational arguments. The, I mean, in the Catholic theology, that is clear. And this is why you have natural law as a rational way of arguing. I mean, uh, Pope Ratzinger would never argue against uh, same-sex marriage or against abortion on religious arguments. He would argue on rational argument which are religious according to him now you may like them or not you can subscribe to those arguments or not in a pluralistic society i don't think that there is a single solution to that as a mathematical model i think that we the, the effort that we have to make is still is to live together in complex societies which have to be able to manage disagreements even in on most well, most important issues but I mean, in the Catholic tradition, the debate between rationality and religion has been dealt with. And I mean, the Catholic tradition for years, of, I mean, Catholic tradition has been censoring books, uh, book of prohibited, uh, list of prohibited books on, where the Catholic was very strong against, you know, books that were criticized, ideas that were very critical of society. But now in Catholic theology, that is almost settled. Oh. Okay, thank you very much for uh, raising the first session. And now, let's it. Thank you. Thank you.